Netflix's new comedy series, What We Do in the Shadows, takes the 2014 indie hit and uh, translates it into a uh, roommate buddy comedy without a bunch of vampires. I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby, and with me now is that show's cinematographer, DJ Stipson. He just received his first Emmy nomination for the series. Uh, and DJ, uh, first of all, let me just ask you, this is your first nomination. Uh, was this something you were expecting? Was it a, a nice, pleasant surprise for you? It's actually my second nomination. Oh, I'm sorry. IMDb is very slow to update. <laughs> you got a, a daytime Emmy nomination, is that right? Yeah, yeah. For um, okay. My apologies. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, so second one. So, yes, it was a complete surprise to get nominated for Shadows, um, especially as the, uh, the premise of the show is to, is to make it look as mockumentary as possible. So it's, it's not, you know... It's not going to be a DOP showreel kind of thing. And then here's this odd thing where uh, actually people loved it so much and loved all the hard work that we, me and the lighting team and the grip team, we all put into it that they actually, um, wow, we got nominated. I mean, it's absolutely outstanding. I can't believe it. So you worked on the original film. Yeah. Um, talk a bit about the transition from film to TV series. Um, what were some of the... Um, I guess, uh, aesthetic differences or things that you guys wanted to maybe try to improve on or do differently? Like, what were some of the uh, differences between doing the film and doing the television show? Sure. Uh, the differences were huge. So the film was made for a lot less money than the TV series, uh, obviously. And um, I've got to tell you, when we were making the film, nobody thought it would be such a huge hit. And, uh, and that, that was a, an amazing surprise and so cool. Um, so we made it pretty lo-fi. And the premise that Jermaine and Taika brought to the film was that we, we didn't, it had to be true to its roots, which was to make it a mockumentary. So there were certain things that we wanted to use, like a light on top of the camera, uh, to remind the audience that there was a crew following these vampires. Um, it's, I guess it's more like a, a cops-style show and less like a documentary in that sense that there was very deliberate aesthetic choices like putting that on, uh, putting the, cam the light on the camera. The other thing was because they wanted to treat it so much like a, a, a mockumentary or reality show, they wanted to make sure that no one else apart from the shooting crew and themselves, Tyker and Jermaine, knew what was in the script. So all the other characters in the film weren't allowed to see the script. And that was so that they had to react to the guy's performances on set and keep it feeling real. It was organic and changing all the time, exactly like what a documentary would be. You don't, you know, I mean, there is script of reality, but we were really going for true documentary in that style. And that made it incredibly fun. I mean, the other characters would turn up to the set, to like the house set, or, I mean, that's the best example, to the house set, completely dressed, made up, ready to go, and we would be waiting inside with the cameras and them rolling, and uh, the guys would open the front door of the house set and invite them in, and we would start shooting the scene. So that's fantastic, and in story, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, as a cinematographer, that's incredibly hard because the whole set has to be lit and live changed uh, so that the, the guys can go anywhere they want, the actors can go anywhere they want, and we have to follow them. The other massive difference was that Tyker and Jermaine acted and directed the film, and they weren't acting in uh, they weren't acting in the series apart from one very small time. So, acting and directing uh, both of them it was really tough on the film. We had to shoot it and they had to review it, discuss it, go back, shoot it again in a different way or a different kind of performance. But it was a great learning curve for me in the sense of what they were after and honing those skills. Uh, in order to do the series. And I, I actually must add, I didn't shoot the pilot. Um, Christian Springer right. shot the pilot in LA. And he did an amazing job. And I, I mean, he was really dropped in it as far as he had no kind of back end skills working with those guys like I did on the film. And um, he did an, a really impressive job jumping in for nine days and, and shooting episode one. So he did, he did a stellar job. And, and he's certainly um, part of the Emmy team, I would say. Absolutely. Um, you, you brought up the lighting, and that uh, was that brings up something else I wanted to ask you. What's so interesting about the show? I mean, general rule for comedy is that it has to be brightly lit. 
And here you have a show that, because of the characters, has to take place all at night. Um, can you talk a bit about um, how you, uh, not to mention the fact that you've also got this rather gloomy subject material, so, um, <laughs> you know, you're working with a lot of shadows and things like that. Uh, can you talk a bit about how you design the lighting in such a way that you both stay true to the subject matter, but also, I guess, allowed for laughs? I mean, was that a difficult, was that a difficult balance to strike? Yeah, that would have been a difficult balance to strike if I hadn't done the film. Mm -hmm. I learned so much on the film and uh, that it taught me how dark we could go but still get the performance. And I, I think, I, yeah, I think I learned so much from that that I pushed things quite hard. There were occasions when Jermaine would say to me on the series, go, mate, you know, I've got, I've got to see their eyes in this one. Can you just lift the levels up a little bit? But often they were cool with what we were doing. We, we, we knew the characters so well that not everybody had to be, you know, spotlit all the time, I suppose is the best way to describe it. The other thing is um, I did the movie with the designer, Ra Vincent, and then Ra and I went on to do another spin-off series with Jermaine and Taika in the same sort of vein. And then Ra went to LA and did the pilot, designed the pilot. And then by the time I got to Toronto to shoot the rest of the series, uh, Ra had to go and do another project. So his art director, Kate Bunch, came on and became the designer. And uh, she had done all the Flight of the Concord stuff. She had worked as the art director on the pilot of the What We Do in the Shadows series. So she had a great background in how the guys wanted to work and also the aesthetic of the show. And between her and I, we moved some lighting around inside the house, but we concentrated heavily on using the practicals inside the house to light most of the scenes. But we also, had you know ceiling boxes you know soft boxes through the ceiling panels in case in an emergency we had to light up the hallway very quickly because the actors decided to run down the hallway each room had those things we put in the other thing is uh we wanted to put in lots of complementary colors and that's the danger of the premise of the house which is it's a warm safe place for the vampire but it's also very run down and uh distressed and it naturally with candlelight lend itself to the yellow end of the spectrum. And if everything's, and the, and the wallpapers are green and there's a lot of green in the house. So if everything's yellow and green, you've got nowhere to go later on in the color timing to separate the actors out from the backgrounds. And of course, they're generally in black because they're vampires. The familiar uh, Guillermo who's in the house is in, uh, you know, see reasonably bright colors. And so is um, the daytime uh, vampire. And, and so it, it was a real mission to make sure that we could bring blue <clears throat> in, which is a daylight color, which is very hard to build into the set because you don't want anything to look like daylight. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also used um, lavender gels for the moonlight so that we could make it this sort of quite white light so it wasn't like daylight. And we used those colors to separate the actors out from the set. And I think that worked reasonably well. The tricky bit is uh, that we had to maintain the premise that the house was a nice, warm, safe place for the vampires because when we went outside to most of our locations, we were deliberately looking for uh, brightly lit, you know, supermarkets or convenience stores or car parks or anything like that because we wanted the vampires to really feel like fish out of water when they, when they went outside of the house, not only in story terms with bureaucracy, and how crazy things had got, like there were motor vehicles and, you know, things like that, that they was just sort of getting used to because they'd been stuck in the house so long. But also that um, it felt uncomfortable for them to be outside of the house. So the house always had to feel welcoming. The other tricky bit about the house set as opposed to the locations was that, A, the vampires should be able to move anywhere in the house they wanted. So we were live dimming up and down throughout the house with our board op. Uh, Peter Molnar was, you know, on, always on the sliders trying to get things moving as the actors moved through the rooms. We had candle uh, LED practicals that we would hide out of shot, which gave flicker effects, and we had some in shot. We also had little LED strips, and we made these custom soft boxes. I mean, we just hid lights everywhere, on backs of chairs, under tables. So we could dim those up and down so that you – could maintain the premise of a mockumentary and go from a wide group shot that may contain five to seven actors and crash zoom in to someone's close up uh, and still see some light in their eyes uh, so it wasn't pitch black on their face. 
And that's, I've got to say, that's the hardest lighting job I've ever done because you can't just do it shot by shot. You are literally gunning down the whole scene and the operators should be able to do whatever they want. And so that, that's a real lighting challenge. But I loved it. Every day was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to give it a go. And generally it worked out. It was pretty good. I'd say it certainly does sound complicated. <laughs> just <laughs> listening to it. Um, <laughs> too long. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I wanted to ask you about your nominated episode. You uh, were nominated for the episode Manhattan Nightclub. Uh, first yep. of all, when did you choose to submit that episode? When did I choose to submit the episode? Why? Why did you choose to submit it? It's, it's, that's an interesting thing. It, it was really hard to choose which episode to put in for the Emmy nomination. Um, they, everyone had its own little thing, but the Manhattan nightclub one particularly had, it was pretty lighting heavy, and it was also pretty uh, colourful lighting heavy, heavy. So I guess that's why I chose it. There were other episodes um, that were technically probably more challenging, uh, but they didn't quite have the lighting aesthetic that I wanted to present to the Academy and, and hope that they, they voted for me, which was, it was for a nomination, which was amazing. Um, there's one that springs to mind, which I did with um, Taika, where we designed a one-shot scene that was huge. I mean, it was just massive. It was a Gregor uh, Naja's love interest breaks out of an asylum. Uh, he goes through a huge amount of stunts, and then he ends up driving on a stealing a car and driving on rimless wheels that are sparking past a convenience store and crashing into a power pole and then these kids are shooting it on their phone and then we run up to Gregor and it's all preset and he's lying on the grass and he runs up to the convenience store and throws a motorcyclist out the way and jumps on his bike and takes off and then cop cars turn up and then we had a chopper light up in a, in a uh, lift to you know it was huge it was all at night I, I could go into more detail if you want but it was massive but mm -hmm. That was only 30 seconds of, you know, one of those episodes, and it, didn't, it wasn't quite as heavy on the lighting as, as what uh, the Manhattan nightclub was. Right. And it's interesting, too, because, I mean, you do have this, uh, this huge set that you have to uh, do a lot of elaborate kind of club lighting in. So, uh, I mean, it really does show off the kind of, like, care that you have to take in order to create atmosphere on a set and to like really place us there, you know? I think um, the, the, funnily enough, the premise about how we went about lighting the nightclub was there was a line in the script that actually, I don't think made it into the episode in the end. So there's a gag, it might have actually, hmm. There's, a, there's basically a gag where uh, they're trying on clothes and it's that, and there's a little interview in the house and it's that, you know, capes are really fashionable. Everybody should be wearing a cape. And so our vampires who are preparing to leave Staten Island to go to Manhattan, which is for them a big deal, which is part of the joke. Uh, and, of course, they use a rowboat to get there and a taxi and a traffic jam. So it's, it's really, it's brilliant. But, but the idea was that um, capes are fashionable because they haven't left their house, it seems, since about the 20s. And so they're still saying capes are fashionable. And so they, they do this thing where they're getting dressed and they go, you know, the, your cape needs to be bigger. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be bigger. And then they turn up at the nightclub and it looks like a modern nightclub, except it's full of vampires and no one's wearing a cape. And that's the joke. So I, we, we took, the gaffer and I, took, Andrew Sneed, we, we took that idea and went, well, we need to make sure that the nightclub is the absolute opposite of the house. So it's got to be ultra modern. It's got to have a lot of LEDs in it. It's got to have, have a lot of Mac movers, uh, you know, moving lights. It's got to feel so different from the house. And also that the, when, when the vampires walk in, they're like, oh, it's actually not a 1920s club anymore. This is actually what modern vampires do. And so we spent a lot of time and took a lot of care to make sure that we got all that stuff right. It, not only in the fact that it was all LED fittings, we didn't use any incandescence because we wanted to keep it ultra modern but also we had like fluorescent tubes everywhere and when when kate bunch the designer and jermaine talked about having humans as food and cages being made to dance we were like well let's light the cages with fluorescent tubes so that you know we can keep everything looking i wouldn't say science fiction but you know what i mean like very very modern so that as soon as those guys walk in they feel completely out of place right 
before I let you go, let me just ask you, um, you, you know, having worked on the movie and, and worked on the series uh, with Taika and Jermaine, uh, what is that collaboration like? And I wonder, I mean, since it was, that was early on in all of your careers, I mean, what have you learned since then that has really uh, helped you go on to, you know, these, these bigger and, and better things, right? Well, not better in terms of quality, but maybe just you know, better crew. <laughs> the movie is still wonderful, so <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. Um, uh, I think what the guys taught me was to. It's like throwing away everything that you know as a DOP, and being okay with embracing a style that's really feels like as a DOP death by a thousand cut but actually it's not if you if you can learn the skills you need to make that stuff look good and also how to light scenes in a way that you can go from these wide shots to close-ups that's an incredible skill and it's not one that I would have had if I hadn't done the film in the series I learned so much as a DOP about that and I'm not sort of advocating or saying that that's the greatest thing that you should want or need to do. I guess what I'm saying is that it's a skill that I've got in my back pocket that I know that when you've got five minutes left in the day, I can light a scene very quickly knowing I can get away with it by the skin of my teeth. And that's an incredible skill to walk away with from a film like what we do in The Shadows and to take to the series and then actually learn more on the series. And, and honestly, I've brought it to other projects where we have literally had five minutes to go and I've got, I don't know how to do this real quick because I've been in this situation for 12 hours a day for a long time. Yeah. Well, DJ, thank you so much for your time and uh, congratulations on your Emmy nomination. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Lovely to chat. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all you at home for watching. Make sure you uh, click the like and subscribe button below and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Emmy news.